So you know this person, you've seen these people, or maybe you are this person, that you are so excited for this particular event, this concert, this sporting event, this rally, and you got the good seats, you know, the ones that the people that you came to see are going to walk right by those seats. You know, you're right along the aisle, and they're going to come out that tunnel. They're going to come right down the street, and you're so excited to see them. Like, you're going to see them. You're going to see them. And so you're counting down. Here they come. You know, you know the big lights and show is going on, and you're seeing them come. You're like, oh, this is so cool, and this is what you do. And then the next thing that happens is you pull out this, right? Because you got to take a picture of the people that you so desperately want to see, and you got to be in the picture. It's all got to be about you and yourself, and you got to be in the selfie. And it's such an interesting thing in our culture and thing today. So I figure since we're here today, let's take a selfie. Ready? One, two, three. All right. I like it. All right. Now everybody smile. Everyone smile real big. All right. Now pretend like you just heard the funniest joke in the world, and it wasn't from me, that's for sure. Ready? One, two, three. All right. Now pretend like you really dislike the person you're sitting next to. You're in a big fight. You just can't wait to beat them up. Ready? One, two, three. All right. Looking good. Looking good. I figured I'd just preach my whole message this way. Wouldn't that be fun? I get to, like, preach to myself the whole time. It's good. I see you out there. No, let's not do that. That'd be bad, right? Like, there's something about seeing you. And seeing your face and interacting with you in this message, that makes a big difference. And yet there's something in our world, in our culture, that loves to be the center of the camera, the center of everything. And so today's message is about the idol of self. The idol of self. And you're like, yeah, let's get those people that post 10 selfies a day. Let's get them. Let's get those people that it's all about them. It's always about their accomplishments, about how good they are, about their job that they have, and they're just always good, right? Well, that's certainly a thing, and we don't want to live that way. Uh, but this message is not about that. This message is about the complete opposite of that. Because in my experience, a lot of people, including myself, struggle with self-centeredness in the complete opposite way. Like it's not about how great we are and how good things are and how much we've achieved. It's about how bad we are and the problems we have and how much maybe we've failed or, or not succeeded. And so you're like, well, doesn't the Bible talk about humility the virtue of humility, and, and it certainly does, but humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking about yourself less. And so today, we're going to look at a story in the scripture, an encounter of Jesus, who meets a woman who I think has every right and every opportunity to think very little of herself, to have very low self-worth, and she doesn't let that stop her. She pushes through those barriers, and as a result, Jesus commends her by having great faith, mega faith. And so if you want to have great faith, this message is for you. And if you want to have a healthy view of yourself, this message is for you. And so if you have your Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15 is where we are going to be today. I would love to send you home with a free Bible. If you don't have one, you can grab one in the lobby. And of course, the words will be on the screen as well. We're going to be looking at Matthew 15 verses 21 through 28 today. And let me just warn you, Jesus in this story says and does some really interesting things. And you're going to think, Jesus did that? Jesus said that? And he did. And he did it all to show off this woman's great faith. And so let's see what happens here. It says, Jesus left Galilee 
and went north to the region of Tyre and Sidon. So, so he goes north. He's just been dealing with the Pharisees. They don't have any faith. They don't trust him. It's all about them. And Jesus needs a rest. We see this often. Jesus is going off to rest, to pray. And so this is what he does. He goes north, and he leaves Israel. And so this is modern-day Lebanon. All right, he's out there, and we only read two times in Jesus' ministry that he leaves Israel, and this is one of those times. So he goes up to this region, and there he encounters a Gentile woman who lived there, and she came to him. And we don't know a lot about this woman, this Gentile woman, but what we do know about her is more than enough to understand what God is trying to teach us here. And first, no matter where Jesus went, people are going after him. People are attracted to him. People are going to find him, including a woman, which for us today is not such a big deal. But in the first century, in this part of the world and probably everywhere, wait, a woman was like, this wasn't, a woman wasn't going to be talking to a man. A woman wasn't going to be spending time in, in the public square talking to a man. And, and not only was she... Um, a woman, but she was a Gentile woman, which again makes it even worse. Like a Jewish person wouldn't be talking to a Gentile person, most likely. But Jesus engaged with women all the time, and Jesus did incredible things to raise the value of women in society in incredible ways. It was, it's, a, it's amazing to see. But she was literally, the word is a Canaanite woman. And so a Canaanite was somebody who lived in the, the promised land, Israel area, before Israel came in and conquered it. And so this is fascinating. When, when Israel was led out of Egypt and they were into the promised land, there was people already there, and they had been there for a long time. And God told Israel to wipe them out, completely destroy them, like just obliterate them. And you might wonder, or your friends might wonder, wow, God would do that to a whole group of people? Just destroy them? It's one of the harder questions in the Bible, in the Old Testament. And if you got that question, I'd love to talk more about it. But you might be wondering why God would tell Israel to do that to these Canaanite people. And so here's why. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 20, we read this. It says that in those towns that the Lord your God is giving you as a special possession, destroy every living thing. You must completely destroy the Hittites, the Amorites, there's the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, just as the Lord your God has commanded you. And why? This will prevent the people of the land from teaching you to imitate their detestable customs in the worship of their gods, which would cause you to sin deeply against the Lord your God. See, this is about idol worship. God wants your worship. And there's so many other things. This nation worships so many little things that tried to get in the way of worshiping the true God. And they did some pretty horrible things in the worship of this God, of their gods, like Baal or Dagon. We've talked about some of these, and we'll continue to talk about them. They, they sacrificed children to these gods. They committed incest and adultery. There was a temple prostitution system. Like, there's all these horrible things that this, these people would participate in in the worship of their gods. And one of those gods that this woman's family and history would have worshipped throughout the years was the god Dagon. And we talked about him in the story of Jonah. Remember that? He's the, the fish god, the water god. He's got the fish tail. And so whenever the water shows up, right, the, the crops grow, things are good, life is flowing, right, you're feeling good about yourself, yourself is, is puffed up, it's doing well, you got everything you need. You know, when Dagon shows up, when the water shows up, like, life is good. But I told you also last week how our God, the true God of the universe, loves to show up and show off against all other gods, doesn't he? And we see it in all throughout the scriptures. And so Dagon shows up in 1 Samuel chapter 5. And 
It's in the Philistine camp. They got a temple to this God. They got a big statue to him inside the temple. And they bring the Ark of the Covenant into the temple. And so the Ark of the Covenant was where God's presence chose to dwell in that moment in time. And so the Ark of the Covenant comes in next to this idol statue of this fish thing. And so they leave it there and they go back and they come in the next day. And the next day, this idol Dagon is flat on his face. And the people there are wondering, what happened? Maybe there was like a bad windstorm. Maybe somebody came in here and vandalized it or something. Like, this is not good. And so they tip this big statue, this big idol back. And they say, okay, like, well, well, we're good. And so they leave. Well, the next day, they come into the temple again. And this time, Dagon's fallen over again. But not only has he fallen over, his head has completely snapped and broken off, and his arms completely snapped and broken off, and he's just laying there in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And so the Philistines are like, get this Ark of the Covenant out of here. This thing is ruining our entire system. We can't operate. We can't live with this Ark here. So they, they got rid of it. They sent it away because our God loves to show up and show off against all other gods. And this is the the family and the heritage that this Canaanite woman comes with and brings with as she encounters Jesus. And so here's what she does. She comes and she pleads with Jesus, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. So this woman... I think, approaches Jesus in such a good way, doesn't she? I mean, you see the heart of a mother. Oh, man, the heart of a mama, right? They're going to fight for your kids. Her daughter is is not doing well. She's sick. She's dealing with the issues, and she needs help, and she's going to do whatever she needs to do to care for her kids. It's a beautiful heart of a mother. But she's probably already tried all the stuff she knows, all the family heritage, all the family cultures, all the, the different things they did to worship her gods, the Canaanite gods, she'd probably already been there. She'd been to the temple. She did the ritual. She did all this stuff, and her daughter was still not well. And so she brings her to Jesus. And now that's such a good illustration, right, of, of these idols that we follow, these idols that we worship. Like, we'll run to them, we'll go to them because we think we can control them and they make us feel good for a moment. But when we really need something, we're going to go to God because ultimately he's the one that can really help. And that's what this woman does. And she comes and says, oh, Lord, son of David, right? She's addressing him. This is a messianic title. This is a, hey, you're the Messiah. You're the promised one. I believe this. I trust this. And she says, have mercy on me. Now, what a way to approach God. Have mercy on me. Mercy is don't give me what I deserve. And so often we approach God like, I deserve you to help me. I deserve you to answer my prayers. I deserve you to heal me. I deserve for you to do this in my life because I don't know, I'm good and I've been kind and I've been faithful and I've been attending church and I've been doing this. And God, you, I deserve for you to bless me. But this woman approaches Jesus saying, don't give me what I deserve because what I deserve really because of my sin is separation from God forever. What I deserve, God, is not good, but your mercy is good. Like, you're not going to give me what I deserve. I I trust that your grace is good, that your mercy is enough. She, She approaches Jesus in such a great way. Have mercy on me. And so she she pleads with him, she begs him, and Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. And I told you Jesus does some interesting things in this encounter, and you're like, Jesus is just going to ignore this woman? She's got a problem. She's got a great heart. She approached it so well, and Jesus just blows her off. But really, this was going to be a normal thing in the first century culture. 
when a woman, especially a Jewish or a Gentile woman, approached a man, especially a Jewish man, they, they weren't going to talk. They, it would have been normal just to kind of assume that they weren't there, that they weren't doing anything. But if that was me, or, or put yourself in her shoes, I mean, you work up the courage to come to Jesus. Like with all the baggage that you have, like, yeah, you worship those other gods, and yeah, you, you, you've got the family issues, and yeah, your, your family history, was your, your, your entire ancestors were supposed to be wiped out because God told the nation of Israel to wipe them out. And yet the nation of Israel didn't completely obey God, and some of them were still around. And so this woman shouldn't have even been here in the first place. God said you were supposed to be destroyed back a thousand, a thousand some years ago. But she's here, and she brings all of this to Jesus. She works up the courage to come to Jesus, and Jesus doesn't even answer her. He ignores her. And if that was me, you know what I would feel? I'd say, that's exactly what I was expecting to happen. Why would he listen to me? I'm a loser. I got nothing to offer him. Of course, that's exactly what would happen. And you know what? It's like that being ignored is like driving a nail into your confidence. It just crushes your soul, and it messed up who you are, right? It impacts you. It tears you down, and it crushes your spirit. We're ignored, and it's a barrier that this woman faces when she comes to Jesus. And it could do that. It could crush you and make you back off. But I'm telling you today about a faith in Jesus that pushes through the barriers and leads to great faith and great miracles. And so this is just the, the first barrier, and there's many more to come. And so not only was she ignored, but then somebody else chimes in. Jesus' disciples urged him to send her away. Tell her to go away, they said. She is bothering us with all her begging. It's the disciples around Jesus that are the ones putting up the barriers, preventing this woman from getting to Jesus. And some people, some people want to know Jesus, but it's the people who already claim to follow Jesus that prevent others from connecting with Jesus, right? Like they like Jesus, they just don't like the people that claim to follow Jesus. It's the, the institution that is a barrier and that crushes you and it makes you back down, makes you back away. Because you try so hard, and it's the people that get in your way. And so, like, maybe, and this happens all over, all over the country, all over the world, every single Sunday, maybe you work up the courage to say, I'm going to come to church, because I need God, and where else can I go to get God than a church? And yeah, you know, you got baggage like this woman does, right? You got, you got family issues. You got stuff that you're dealing with. You've been, you've been all, doing all sorts of other things, worshiping all sorts of other gods. But you're like, I, I just need God. I, I need something different. I need the real thing. And so you work up the courage to go to this church. And you show up, and the Christians have made it so hard for you to find God, you know, the church meets in a weird place. They don't have good signs. So, like, you show up, you want to go, but you, like, literally cannot find where it is. And, and it's, just, it's just a strange experience. And so, like, you park in the parking lot, and you're, 
You're like, you work up the courage again to, to open the door and you start walking towards the front door. And like some of you felt this before and like your heart is racing. You're like, I don't know what I'm going to experience. I don't know what's going to happen here. And you're like, you know, you're just trusting God every step of the way. And it's so hard. And so then you like glance over to the side and there's another person, a man, a woman, and they kind of know what they're doing. At least it looks like it to you. And they're walking in, and they know what's going on. And whether it's intentional or not, it's probably not intentional, but you kind of, they kind of glance, and like they're like, oh, I don't know them, and I've never seen them before. I wonder you know, how it's, how, what they're doing. And what the, the person whose heart is racing and just needs the courage to come in those doors, what they feel is, oh, geez, that person doesn't want me here. And in those those moments of walking even towards a front door are like the hardest thing, and they might just go turn around and go back in the car and go somewhere else. The Christians make it so hard to get to Jesus. And I wonder, like even in our context here at Connect Us Church, I wonder how many people woke up in the morning saying, hey, I'm going to go to Connect Us Church, and they ended up at Starbucks. I don't know if that's happened for sure, but I can almost guarantee that it has because the institution, the barriers put up so many walls to get to Jesus. Or, or maybe you can think about it this way, like at work, you like the people that you work for. You just don't like the people that you work with, right? Or you're new to the area. You just moved here, you're visiting, and you don't feel like these people here accept you or welcome you or have time for you, right? It's that feeling of the institution, the system getting in the way, but not this woman. This woman did not let that barrier stop her from seeing what she needed to see with her daughter. And so what happens next, the disciples tell her to go away, but Jesus speaks up. And Jesus says to the woman, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. Again, you're like, that's Jesus? That's Jesus. He's saying, you're not from the right religious background. You're too far gone spiritually. You're too spiritually disconnected for my time. I didn't come for you, Jesus is telling her. Which, again, sounds not like Jesus at all. But here he's, he's reiterating or he's, he's telling his disciples in a way that my mission is still the same. My priority, not value, but my priority is to the Jews first. This woman is certainly important, absolutely. But my priority is to the Jews, the people of Israel first. See, God, that's how his plan was from the very beginning. He was going to come as a Jew, Jesus was Jewish, and he was going to bless the whole world through the nation of Israel. But eventually, the Gentiles were going to be welcomed in, and it wasn't going to be that many years later. But right now, right in this story, Matthew 15, it was still the focus on Israel, and Jesus was just reminding them, yeah, we're in, Israel, we're in Gentile territory, but we haven't moved on yet. Like, we're still in the, the Israel phase, okay? The Israel phase comes first, but this must have made this woman feel so insignificant. So insignificant. The priority wasn't her. Have you ever felt insignificant? That you didn't matter? That they always overlook you? That could crush you. It could crush your spirit, your, your view of yourself. There was uh, one time when I applied for a job back in high school, and uh, I had never had a job before, and some of my friends were getting jobs at restaurants and stuff like that, and so I'm like, all right, I think I could get a job and apply for a job at this restaurant. I liked it there. And, and I, my schedule in the summer was, like, really busy. I had sports. I had trips. And so, like, I don't think I was a great candidate. But in the moment, I'm like, come on, I'm, you know, give me a job. I'm a good guy. And so I show up at this restaurant, and uh, I apply for it, and I get my application, and I go in. And so they told me, they're like, Kevin, we need you 
to shave your beard. It's like, okay, I can do that. Like, that's fine. You know, I've only actually, like, completely shaven my beard, like, probably a handful of times since then. But I went home and I shaved my beard because they wanted me to, right? And I figured, hey, if they're telling me to shave my beard, that at least they're interested in me, that I'll, I'll be able to work at least sometime. Nope. I'm like, they made me shave for literally no reason. Like, they didn't even, like, answer me or recall anything. I'm like, wh- why did you tell me that? I felt so insignificant. Like, are you serious? Really? <laughs> You're really going to do that? Insignificant. The barrier of feeling insignificant, right? It could crush us. But this woman doesn't let that stop her. This woman keeps fighting through these barriers, and she keeps getting through being ignored and being that frustrated with the institution and feeling insignificant. She keeps pressing forward. She doesn't give up. And so she came to Jesus and worshiped him, And pleading with him again, great faith is persistent faith. Lord, help me, help me, help me. And Jesus responded, It isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. Jesus, you can't call that lady a dog. You can't do that. He did called her a dog, which again, right, being insulted is a huge barrier. And that's an easy one. Sometimes it's the smallest words and the smallest phrases that make the biggest impact on our heart and our soul. Sometimes there's specific words or specific phrases that trigger these alarm bells that go off. And it's the insult. It's everywhere. It impacts us. There was a time, another story, there was a time a couple years ago when I was walking into a Dairy Queen. Not around here, okay? And uh, I was carrying my little baby in the baby carrier. And we were walking into the Dairy Queen. And let me tell you, the Dairy Queen was open. There was people in the Dairy Queen. And so we were taking my baby into the Dairy Queen. And the door to enter the Dairy Queen was right near where the drive through comes. Okay? And so the, there's a, someone in their car, a lady parked right there at the drive through window, that sees us walking into the front door of the Dairy Queen. She rolls down her window. And she yells something like, I can't believe you're taking your baby in there. She's like, you're terrible parents. I just wanted to like fight her or something, right? I'm like, we'll just walk into the Dairy Queen. But that st- has stuck with me. And I think the insults we face oftentimes hit at the things we care about the most. And it's hard to forget those things, that, that insult, that crush, that stick with your spirit and defeats us. And so Jesus seems like he insults this woman by calling her a dog. But again, in first century culture, this was... I mean, I don't don't think it was right, but it was the normal thing that happened. The Jews would consider the Gentiles dogs. And dogs were like the outsiders. These 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 are dogs that roam, the dogs that eat weird stuff, carcasses, dogs that do things out in the wild. And they would normally just refer to the Gentiles as dogs. But don't miss this. Jesus uses a special word for dog. Not the wild dog, not the outsider dog. He calls this woman a pet dog. Still a dog, but a pet dog. A pet dog. You know, one of those dogs that you have in your house that's a part of your family that 
gets everything that you got, a pet dog. And so rather than letting the insult keep her down, she picks up on what Jesus is saying here. And instead of hanging on to the fact that Jesus just insulted her by calling her a dog, she hangs on to the hope that Jesus just called me a pet dog. Oh, he, he just called me a pet dog. Come on, there's some hope there. This is something I could really, I could work with this. And so she replied to Jesus, that's true, Lord. But even dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall beneath their master's table. Oh, she knows what's going on. She's picking up on, on what Jesus' metaphor that she's using. And she's persistent in her faith. She's going to do anything that she can do to help her daughter. She says, even the pet dogs are allowed to eat the leftovers. Yeah, you're not going to take the food from the kids and just give it to the dogs. You're not going to do that. And I know you're not going to do that. But I'm a pet dog, and I get to eat whatever my master is eating. And come on, somebody, if my master is eating steak and lobster, what's that pet dog eating? Steak and lobster. It's a good day in the pet dog's world, right? And so if your master, God, is God of the universe, he's got it all. Oh, as a pet dog, that's yours. You're just waiting for that opportunity to come in and, and clean it up. And see, this is the thing about great faith, is you got to press through these barriers. you got to fight through these things that want to hold you back and crush your spirit and fight through them. And it's going to take persistent faith. I mean, you, you can bang on the door of the idol all you want. You can run to that thing and say, come on, do something for me. Give me what I want. And it's not going to hear you. It doesn't love you. It doesn't know you. It can't do anything. But you keep knocking on the door of the Lord, the one who does love you, the one who does know you, the one who is gracious towards you. Oh, he's going to answer sometime soon. You just got to keep knocking. You got to keep persisting in your faith. And so Jesus said this. He said, dear woman, your faith is great. Literally in the Greek, your faith is mega, mega faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was instantly healed. This is only the second time. There's two times in the Bible where there's, Jesus says somebody has great faith. And this is one of those times. And I think it's because she didn't let being ignored hold her down or keep her back. She didn't let the institution get in her way or feeling insignificant or the insult consume her life. And she continued to persist, believing that God was going to come through for her, to do something for her daughter that only Jesus could do. And because she continued to pursue, she did not stop here. These things built her great faith. She was able to see the miracle. And this miracle was here the entire time. Right? It was just sitting here the entire time. But the persistent faith, the I'm not going to give up faith, the I'm going to push through these barriers and not let them knock me down and knock me out is what led her. And it's going to what lead you to the miracle that God has for you in your life. But so often, we get stuck on the first barrier, and we give up way too soon. We got to keep pressing forward, keep pursuing the Lord, keep pursuing God, and He will eventually answer you. He is an amazing God, and He will 
promise, he has promised to satisfy your every need. And so, uh, finally, I want to end our message and our time together with a very practical ending. And maybe for you, you've been dealing with an unhealthy view of yourself. And you've let the feeling of being ignored in the institution and the insignificance and being insulted, and you've let that control your life, consume your life. And you're recognizing today that you've missed out on the miracle that God has for you because you've let these things get in the way. And I just want to encourage you today to push through your fears, to press through your insecurities and keep pursuing the Lord, keep pursuing relationships, keep pursuing your next steps. And super, super practically, maybe today, before you leave today, maybe today, you'll take a selfie. Now I know, right? You're like, I don't want to do that. I don't take pictures of myself. I don't like the way I look in pictures. I don't like my hair today. I don't like this. I don't, right? I'm, I'm up here taking pictures, and you're like scared to death. And you're like, oh, geez, what's he going to do with that? I don't want to be in that picture, right? So if that's you, I especially say, take a picture of yourself today. Take a picture. Even if for the only reason it's a symbol that says to, to yourself, says to God, I am valuable to God. And I don't have to think less of myself but I'm choosing today to think of myself the way that God thinks about me. And yeah, you know what? I might be a dog, but at least I'm a pet dog. And my master, oh, he has some good cooking going on, and I get to eat better with him as my master than I could do on my own. And so you're saying, hey, God, here I am. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to follow you. And I'm going to get myself out of the way. Sound good? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you hear our persistent prayers. And when it seems like there's barrier after barrier coming our way, Lord, may we see it as just an opportunity to develop great faith, mega faith. Lord, I pray for, for the people today, for us that have felt ignored, that we've faced difficulty with other Christians or other believers, with churches. Lord, we've, we've fought through feelings of being insignificant, of being overlooked. And we've dealt with just straight up insults. God, that you would help us, give us the faith, give us the courage, give us the ability to press through these barriers, to fight through these barriers, to knock them down and kick them out of the way and say, God, I am pursuing you. I am fighting for you. I, I want a relationship with you, Jesus. I want to strengthen my relationship with you. I trust that you are the one to give me what I need. I'm believing in you, and I'm not going to let anything get in my way. So, Lord, help us to do that today, to have a healthy view of ourselves, and to push through these things that so easily stop us. I ask your blessing upon us now in Jesus' name. Amen.